Well, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, the last session of the Smart Buildings Exchange. Um, to uh, all of our attendees, I hope that you have uh, gotten a lot of value uh, out of uh, this two-day conference. Uh, and uh, as a person affiliated with the Smart Building Center, um, I want to thank our sponsors um, across the board who have been very gracious uh, with their support for uh, this particular conference. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing everybody again next year, hopefully in person, uh, to talk about um, smart building issues. So I'm going to invite uh, uh, my panelists to um, go ahead and join us by activating their video uh, and their audio. Hey, welcome, folks. I'm very excited about this panel. Uh, my name is Stan Price. I'm with the Smart Building Center, and I'm going to be serving as the moderator today. Uh, we have a really great group um, put together here, which is going to have, a, I think, a really lively conversation uh, that I think will be a capstone, I think, on much of the conversation that's occurred uh, throughout the two days in relationship to developing, building, and articulating the value proposition associated with having smarter or intelligent grid interactive uh, buildings um, in our in our built environment. So um, I am um, going to ask each one of them to just introduce themselves uh, and give just a little bit of a thumbnail about your, yourself, your work, uh, and what got you into doing what you're doing. Uh, so I'm going to ask Hendrik to start off. Great, thanks, Dan. So I'm Hendrik Van Hemer. I'm the managing director of Edo, and Edo is a relatively new company. It was born out of a partnership between McKinstry and Avista, and we are focused on decarbonization through the use of uh, grid interactive efficient buildings. So we're we're really you know focused on this idea that buildings have a role to play in decarbonizing the entire energy system and providing resources back to the grid. And I've been in this kind of energy, both at the building level and at the utility level for the last uh, 10 plus years at McKinstry and, and, and other places before that. So really excited to join. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks, Hendrik. Tanya, you next. Thanks, Dan. Super happy to be here. And thanks, everybody, for um, stay, sticking in there with us till the end. My name is Tanya Barham. I'm the CEO of Community Energy Labs. We are an organization with a mission to affordably enable building decarbonization by 2030 in communities across the United States. And our early focus is on K-12 education and municipal buildings, as well as small and mid-sized commercial. Uh, my history is that I started out on what was not at the time necessarily called an IPP yet, but independent power producers in the uh, deregulated market in 2000 and 2001. So that was pretty darn fun. I was working in California, might have heard about some of what was going on there and wanted to get more into renewable energy. So I founded the Solar for Our Schools program for Bonneville Environmental Foundation here in Portland. That program is still going and they're a really um, great partner of ours. I then worked on the Air Care Plus program with PECI, took a 10-year hiatus and went to healthcare tech. I will never go back there again. And I am so happy <laughs> since 2016 to be back on the building and energy side with all of you uh, working like Henrik on a grid uh, interact, grid efficient grid interactive building. So thanks for having me. Great. Thanks, Tanya, for joining us. Hi, Brendan. Hi, Stan. So Everybody, I'm Brendan O'Donnell, president at Veragrid Consulting. Uh, so I'm the resident EV charging dork on the panel. So what we do is help charging companies design intelligent charging systems, and then customers like fleets and even utilities design programs to support them. Um, so I hope to describe the business case around intelligent charging systems and also hopefully make people on the call a little better consumer if you're in the market for some of those systems. Uh, so Stan, Carrie, thanks for the opportunity. It's nice to wear a nicer shirt than my uh, usual hoodie uh, in the basement <laughs> and have a good conversation. So I think it's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm so glad you dressed up, Brendan. Uh, <laughs> and, and we're really happy to have a transportation voice. Um, that is something that I, I know we would like to have more of 
uh, in a more integrated uh, conversation for those of us who sort of have hung out in the built environment for a long time uh, to make sure that the transportation piece uh, comes together for us. And Brendan, do you mind also talking about what uh, the role that you had in a prior life? Because I think that will uh, help our attendees <laughs> kind of understand some of your perspectives. Sure, I skipped over the whole background. So uh, at Amazon, I implemented their charging system of their uh, logistics fleet. So uh, class six, eight trucks and class three, four vans. Uh, and then a lot of people on the call probably know me from Seattle City Light, uh, where I developed transportation programs there in addition to a bunch of other customer offerings. So um, yeah, that, that's the background is um, in transportation and charging for, uh, I don't know, pushing seven or eight years now at this point. Great, perfect. Well, I wanna jump into the conversation with um, a broad based question. Over the last couple of days, we've certainly heard a lot in various sessions about both kind of current and emerging technologies associated with, you know, better distributed energy resources in buildings. The discussion, at least from the value perspective uh, of, uh, of these sorts of technologies has, has often been framed around, you know, demand flexibility, load shaping, renewable integration. And for those of us who are kind of in the business, all of those are kind of resonant propositions, but they, to my ear anyway, they sound awfully utility centric. So I'm wondering, Hendrik, if you could start off the discussion and then uh, Tanya and Brendan, please jump in. Tell us a little bit from your perspective about why building owners and operators should care about these technologies. Yeah, great question, Steve. So I think, you know, first off, building owners and operators, that's not a homogenous group, right? We have a whole spectrum of needs and, and use cases for those buildings. And so, you know, I tried to kind of bring it up to a higher level as far as what they might get out of these technologies and why they should be interested. But I think it boils down to a you know a few th few benefits. So first is just visibility, right? You have this explosion of digital technologies and buildings, and new stakeholder expectations, and new utility programs, and owners and operators need tools to continue to understand what's going on in their building and how they can benefit both as a building owner and operator for their occupants, but also maybe provide services back. And then buildings also have challenges with control, right? Um, they have segmented control systems. The, the panel yesterday um, spoke really eloquently about some of the challenges of all these siloed systems and the kind of challenge of an operator who's trying to manage schedules for, you know, ring schedules for a school that's, you know, has uncertain uh, schedules based on COVID, all these changes and just the, the need for supervisory control layers and more visibility across different control systems and easier interfaces. And then with that comes some automation. So hopefully that reduces the burden on, on building owners. Um, but at the end of the day, those visibility control and automation hopefully get building owners and operators lower energy costs, greater occupant experience, right? A, a building that's more tailored to the way people are actually using the building. So connection to the occupants in the spaces. And then resiliency, right? So these technologies can increase a building's resiliency and, and a community's resiliency, frankly. So um, th those are kind of the three high level benefits, you know, driving energy costs and operational costs down, creating a better experience for occupants and having a more resilient system. I'd love to, Tanya probably has great ideas to add to that. I'm sure she does, so she should go for it. Either you or, or, or Brendan, Tanya, uh, anything to reflect on in, based on Hendrick's comments? I thought those were really good comments and I'll just add some sort of color commentary to that, you know, from what we've seen. So we are embarking on an interesting journey with about five utilities from across the US and British Columbia. Um, and right now about 30 school districts from across Oregon, Washington, California and other areas of the world. And we have parents, students, educators, building operators and maintenance professionals, maintenance and custodial professionals, all of whom are sort of you know, participants and stakeholders in these buildings. So comfort also means something different to everybody else. And you, know, you tend to, in a lot of these buildings, to have really complex controls, or rather the complexity comes from the fact that there is no sort of uniform building automation system that's all connecting to every device over IP. 
So what happens is a lot of times, you know, if there's an energy manager at all, um, they are wearing a lot of hats. And oftentimes you may have someone like a custodian who's literally just fiddling with thermostats. And then at the end of the month, the energy manager is looking at a bunch of spreadsheets. So when we start looking at like what Henrik said, it's not just about comfort, but it's about, wow, you have all these different objectives as a building owner and operator that you're trying to meet. You want to decarbonize, you want to save money, in some commercial context, you're going to want to reduce your demand charges. That's becoming an increasing part of the bill. And that's only going to worsen as you electrify heating and cooling and transportation. And so, you know, these types of GAD controls are a really great way to automate some of that. So some of these processes can and should be automated. You know, I like to laugh with all my venture capital friends and say, why are we spending so much money on AI for things like language recognition that's just like perpetuating sexism and racism and hiring by accident when we could just be using it to turn fans on and off? Like this is the perfect use for AI. So I think, you know, just to give a little color commentary, I think everything Hendrick said is exactly in the zone, but, you know, it's just getting harder and harder for operators to meet all these complex objectives. And so trying to find ways to leverage automation and AI just makes the achievement of those objectives faster and easier. And it's the kind of stuff AI should be doing. AI does stuff that like a toddler would be good at. And most toddlers I know would be like, if you're like, hey, just turn on the fan when the sun is out, that would be a job that a toddler would love. Therefore, AI will probably be good at doing it, so. More children involvement in our buildings. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, Brendan, please. Uh, Stan, I'm okay. I got. I think I got a transportation one coming to me, but I, I totally agree. And you could be describing a transportation system with what Tanya and Henrik both said. Um, there's a lot of crossover. Yeah, and I just add building owners and operators are buried right now, right? You have lots of policy changes happening. You have stakeholder expectations that are changing really dramatically, first around carbon, but also think about the impact of COVID and how that's changed the way people want to use buildings and want their buildings to be, you know, in support of a healthy environment. And, and then you add on top of that workforce challenges, right? An aging workforce and um, a huge discrepancy of skills needed, everything from you know, hands-on physical work to much more digital kind of in front of screen work. And all those together just means, to Tanya's point, like there's a lot of competing demands and we've got to find ways to make this simpler, not more, not more complicated. And, and GEBS uh, are a way to create value that would allow buildings to invest in these systems that'll automate and simplify operations get better outcomes. Yeah, but uh, I have a host of questions that I know you all I need to get to, but I want to probe on this just for one more second, because I'm riffing off uh, a session that happened earlier this morning where uh, we had a number of owner developers sort of talking about adoption and uh, the hurdles associated with adopting these technologies and buildings. And the conversation trended towards saying, you know, floor to ceiling glass or having a, uh, uh, you know, having a gym or fitness center in your building um, have their own narratives in relationship to the values. And so owners migrate to those without any sort of sell principle associated with it. Um, you all just described a good value proposition, but how much of that narrative do we need to simplify uh, in order um, to begin to position these technologies in a way that gets them more proximate to floor to ceiling glass uh, and a fountain in the lobby? Or is that even possible? Maybe I'll, I'll take a crack at that. And I'll probably touch on this in the next question too, Stan. But the value proposition has to be maybe not understood by a toddler, Tanya, but pretty close. It's gotta be, <laughs> it's gotta be money. It's gonna save you money. And it's gonna make your business run together, uh, run better. That's kind of it. Everything else is derivative, in my opinion. If you want to implement this technology and not just have it be the uh, charging or building dorks that believe in it. Um, so it kind of comes down to that. Why, how is it going to make my gym be more inviting, more you know, well-ventilated, more inviting space? Or how am I going to save money? Very clearly on both OPEX and CAPEX. So to me, for a transportation system or a building system, if you can frame it that way, it's going to be a lot easier to sell to customers. Great. Tanya, um, did love, you want to add I'd to that? I'd love to share. Yeah, I want to take a crack at that. You know, back in 2002, when we were doing solar for our schools, solar was a fringe technology. There was no ITC. Net metering was very rare. 
uh, grid connected solar, I should say. And there was a lot of, we faced a lot of headwinds from um, code inspectors, from electricians, uh, organized labor, uh, from utilities that said we were going to electrocute every lineman in America when these systems would create, uh, you know, a powered up island and they had a downed wire and they were going to get zapped because of um, solar PV. That doesn't happen overnight, that kind of education. I do think that we were, by both integrating it in education and working with STEM educators, um, we were very intentional about using our um, our early pilots as uh, ways to educate the community. Uh, we made solar huggable. You know, it wasn't cost effective for a very long time. When we were installing those systems, I don't know if some of my old colleagues, Bryce or Rob Harmon are on this call, but, you know, we thought we were so clever. We were installing these systems for $18 a watt. <laughs> that was good compared to the price. Oh, wait, we were at 12, I think, 12 cents, $12, and it was $18. And now, you know, these same systems are being installed for at a commercial scale uh, ground mount under $2. So, you know, it really takes a long time to make these changes. And I do think you have to have a compelling um, conversation and you have to think about things like education, workforce, um, safety is huge for the labor force and uh, economic opportunity and value proposition for the building owner is, is another. But, you know, we're also working with multifamily housing developers for low to moderate income housing in California right now, six different projects. And it's a big paradigm shift from what was a big paradigm shift itself, which is net zero, you know, net metering where we just, or net zero building standards where we just zero it out. We say, okay, well, this is on the ledger here for solar. This is on the ledger here for cost. It's going to take us a little while to transition to this new concept. So I agree with everything that Brendan is saying. And I would just say that we need to be relentless. We need to be patient. We need to look at it from all segments of the ecosystem, not just the building owners, but the OEMs, the trade allies, labor, kids, parents, communities, mm -hmm. regulators. All of us just need to you know, keep up the, the good fight. We're all in. And I would say if it, if it comes in the form of one more proprietary software <laughs> board that you have to log into, and you, it, that, then it's not going to get it up, right? We've got to simplify a yeah. lot of our own and operators, not, not make it more complicated. Yeah, good point. Well, I, I want to talk a little bit about, um, we, so we've defined demand flexibility as, as being a, a, a value proposition here. Yesterday, during uh, a, what was a really great session on GEPS, uh, we talked a little bit about sort of, well, what building loads specifically are we talking about flexing, whether that's shifting or shedding or modulating loads. And that discussion rightfully tended to go a little bit towards residential loads because people t tend to think that way. And so, you know, examples of, well, delaying dishwasher cycles, you know, uh, out of peak periods and so forth came up. But uh, our audience today is, is uh, really focused a lot on commercial and, and institutional buildings. So help me understand what sort of loads are we defining here as being um, amenable uh, to to these approaches and how much or how little do we expect that to be affecting the building occupant? Well, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, feel like supposed to, I was supposed to give Brandon first, I, but to the <laughs> audience, I, I assured the panel that I would call out the first person to speak with each question and then I violated my own rule. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let Hendrick start since his mic is on. Sure. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think it's important to note that buildings, you know, today's building stock wasn't designed around flexibility. So it wasn't originally designed to be a flexible resource. So I think part of this is, um, is going to take time for building upgrades and efficiency upgrades. But, but a lot of building systems, you know, the majority of buildings over 50,000 square feet have a control system that's probably being underutilized. So taking advantage of that existing control is the first place to go. And I think there are ways to do that that have no occupant impact. And then there are ways that might have some occupant impact. And that would be a balance between those you know, non-homogenous building owners to make a decision about how they want to manage their building flexibility. I'll, I'll give an example. Like uh, more than 10 years ago, we worked with a school district who had signed up for a, a tariff that got them a, you know, a slightly lower rate, but in exchange, they could get called upon up to four times a month for load shedding. And 
10 years later, they've never been called upon, but it forced them to think through, okay, if we were called upon, what would, how would we shed load? And they went through a really thoughtful process of saying, okay, what spaces in the building are most critical and sensitive? And they started with special ed classrooms and kindergarten classrooms and kind of worked their way through the whole building, thinking about where they would shed load. And then they went through and, and thought about, okay, what, what would be an acceptable amount of shed, meaning, you know, comfort or lighting, you know, changes that might be acceptable. And at the end of that, they came up with a whole bunch of load shedding scenarios for each building. And 10 years later, they use those every single day. And they use them to manage budget. They use them to manage comfort. They use them to, to be proxies for being more occupant um, centric in their operations because they don't have perfect occupancy counters in every room, but they can use these modes. So I think there are good examples of ways that a building a building can currently using the existing control system can shift or shed a lot of load without having occupant impact. And over time, we're going to see more technologies in buildings. They're going to start being designed around flexibility. Well, so whether that's oversizing water tanks or, you know, various thermal storage solutions, those things will start to become more commonplace. And then it becomes easier to think about how a building can be dramatically good at, at providing grid services. But um, and, and I'll just, you know, hop in there too. Um, I, I think uh, Henrik raises a really good point. I'll just put a really quick link in chat uh, about this. There are lots of different use cases. And the thing about load flexibility is when you're looking at hourly load shapes in a building, it's not always as simple as, um, you know, this or that. I, but, the, but what Marianne Payette said uh, yesterday is a good start. I mean, a lot of times you are gonna be looking at HVAC, let's not heat and cool empty rooms. Um, you are going to be looking at if you have on-site solar production and it's a solar rich time where you might otherwise be back feeding to the grid. Um, you might be looking at better matching your heating and cooling, whether that's water or air loads or your electric vehicle and fleet charging loads with your solar output. So it would look to anyone who was looking at your energy profile like energy efficiency, but in fact, you're just self-consuming your own uh, solar output. I put a link down there to the Tonino microgrid project, which was an interesting project that we worked on um, with a school that happens to be all electric because there are no gas lines to that community. And so it was a really good precursor to what we've been looking at in California, where more and more schools due to local codes, pressure from their boards are being urged to transition from about 93% of these schools use gas for heating water and air and their HVAC systems on average in the United States, the average age of a school building is 42 years and the GAO, US GAO found that more than half of HVAC systems are long past when you would expect that that packaged unit should be replaced. <laughs> So um, with AB 841 in California, for example, or um, the, uh, the smart buildings standards in Washington, more and more of these large communities and districts are saying, you know, no more gas. We wanna to try to replace all of our systems with electric. And I think there then you might as well get the value out of those heating and cooling loads. Now occupancy can become a little bit of, uh, you know, it's not, say as easy as modulating charge on a big lever like EV. I think that's part of the reason electric vehicles are so attractive to so many of us. It's such a big load and you can just sort of, you know, throttle the amperage, it, but HVAC has so many more things to take into consideration when you're looking at air quality, et cetera. However, as we're looking to replace gas with electric as more schools may have on-site solar, um, as for example, like Henrik said, occupancy becomes a bigger part of the sensors, the indoor sensors, integrating those in controls, whether it's existing controls or a lightweight gateway that can speak or, you know, something that can speak to the, uh, through the API of the thermostat. More and more often, I think those are going to be probably some of the first things, EV charging, HVAC, and potentially water heat if, um, if folks are transitioning to electric water heat. But you do see, particularly in a lot of these large commercial and industrial buildings, you may have centralized plants, you may have chillers, you've got these systems that can be a little bit more complicated. So I think the first place is going to be packaged rooftop units that are transitioning from gas to electric and heat pumps, if we can get the application controls up and ready electric vehicles, and then of course, if somebody has a battery, you know, modulating that, that control for uh, not just backup and resilience, which is critical during these wildfires and climate impacts we're having, but back, uh, you know, when they're not using that for critical purposes, using some little bit to balance loads as well. Yeah. 
I, I wanted to pick on uh, pick up on something that you said, Tanya, uh, which is just an all the impact of an all electric building. I kind of like to think about this as not what are the most important loads and what are the ones that um, they have to be flexible. It's just by the nature of scale and how they're incremental to a building. So EV charging is the best example of that. You cannot have scaled EV charging without control of that system. It is just not an option, uh, particularly so when it's incremental to an existing site. So yeah, it's 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 a uh, for certain systems that are big and variable, it has to be there. You have to have a system to manage it, but it has to be user friendly and a clear value proposition. You know all the stuff that we led off uh, the call with. Thanks, Brenda. Let me let me direct this question at you to um, sort of follow up on that comment. Uh, EV charging in most commercial buildings is tell me I'm wrong here, but it's to my eye, it's been more of sort of a boutique service. Uh, you know, there's one or two, uh, you know, uh, charging uh, uh, stalls in uh, in in a building to date. Obviously, that's going to completely change uh, as we make this fleet shift uh, over to electric vehicles. And as Tanya observed, and as you observed, this is potentially a really large new load being introduced uh, into buildings when we're just now talking about better managing and reducing loads in buildings. Um, so how do we balance this out? Is this, or EV, is EV charging just going to put, uh, you know, increased stress on a building's electrical service capacity and exacerbating cost problems? Or is this providing a better opportunity to actually integrate EV charging and show demand flexibility uh, by um, using uh, transportation? Thanks. Um, I think it's both. It's an opportunity and a potential huge cost. So I, can you see my screen, Stan? I can. Yeah, so I, I think that this slide really shows the value proposition of um, charging at scale. And scale isn't even a lot, you know, it's tens of charge uh, chargers at a commercial building. If even at a low uh, charging rate, you know, six or seven kilowatts, 10, 20 chargers is a big building end use. Um, so this is not my slide, but I swiped it from DCG who did a really good analysis of with each car that is charging on a facility, what's the incremental cost of that power? And it's a little utility centric, but I think it illustrates what I think is the customer value proposition from a cost and, and the value of flexibility. And so th these two columns are essentially the cost per car of non-optimized and optimized charging. And what it shows is that the big impact from non-optimized char charging is it's the distribution system. And it might sound like the utility pays for that, but it is the customer. So service upgrades, larger utility connections when you're building a building is real money. You know, it's anybody who has gone through that process and the time understands the cost and effort involved. And so whether it's a boutique thing now with two or three chargers, I think the drum that I'm beating here is you don't need that many chargers for it to cost you a lot of money for uh, essentially the cost to upgrade your connection to the electrical grid. Larger transformers, bigger switching, larger cables, uh, and that that's that's money. So it's it's yeah, it's uh, to answer your question, Stan. It is something to be a little mindful of, but it's also an opportunity. If you charging is not that hard to manage if you know how you want to use your vehicles, you have a good software system that you understand. Um, so yeah, it's uh, the it's both. It's a it's a potential uh, thing to be scared of and an opportunity. <laughs> Can yeah, I hop right yeah, on to that? Please, please, Tanya and, and Hendrik both uh, re reflect on uh, this point by Brendan as to um, how you see selling this as an opportunity. Well, I, it, back to what I was saying before, just this huge pent up demand, for example, and if you even just look at HVAC systems, particularly in the retrofit community. So any commercial properties or buildings that need to be retrofitted. So here I'm thinking a lot about multifamily housing um, and existing commercial buildings that have older systems. Over the next 10 years, if most of the West Coast is going to meet its decarbonization goals, we need to basically swap out the entire gas fleet or the older electric fleet and heating and cooling applications to electric. 
And what you're finding in places like uh, California, when you try to do this in multifamily, is that the form factor on a transformer then needed to accommodate that increased capacity necessary for a retrofit is substantial. So what Brendan was just saying about EVs also applies to electrification writ large. And even an individual homeowner may find that, you know, they just, they're, I, for example, have a hundred amp service in my home. So, you know, I have had to do the drip and dribble in order to not exceed um, the capacity of my circuit breaker. So these are real issues coming up with better control um, of loads through something like software, which can be cheap. Uh, and creating more open protocols so you can communicate with those loads in any context, whether that's industrial, commercial, or residential, and sort of freeing the data is going to be a lot less expensive and a lot more flexible of a strategy than brute forcing and gold plating the entire distribution yeah. grid, transmission grid, and home electrical systems. Though some of those upgrades may be necessary, I think you're seeing some really cool innovations from circuit and panel manufacturers so that we can get more granularity and sub metering just as par for the course. But I think what we're going to see is decarbonizing retrofits in particular, we'll really see that 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 challenge that Brendan brings up. And so being smart about how we modulate loads will become a financial necessity, not just for the utilities, but for the customers, because someone's going to have to pay for that otherwise, if we're wasteful about how we use the capacity of those wires. Well done. Well said, Hendrik. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's absolute real cost to the building owners, and it adds cost to these necessary building upgrades. And then at the end of the day, if we create a more ex expensive system, you know, writ large, we're all going to pay for it, right? Rates are going to go up, and we're going to all deal with the pain of, you know, as Tanya said, gold plating this. So I, I think yeah, I completely agree with, with what Tanya and Brent both said. Well, um, I would like to conversationally take us to build a value stack if uh, if we can uh, I like to think about this as like a layer cake uh, of value statements that uh, can be persuasive in relationship to getting to the market to react to these opportunities so I want to throw out a series of about five layers uh, to this cake and have you all reflect on each one in terms of uh, the sort of uh, owner operator side in relationship to value. I want to start with carbon. Uh, again, in an earlier session in this conference, uh, we had um, actually sort of an informal survey done of about 30 owners and developers, uh, certainly not a scientific sample, but um, it was interesting that the results of that survey came back to show a relatively weak link in terms of understanding how smart technologies could contribute to corporate sustainability goals. Uh, and I took corporate sustainability goals to be uh, sort of a way of expressing carbon uh, goals since that tends to be at the forefront these days of, of the sustainability conversation. So um, let's do our best, uh, and I'll, Hendrik, I'll have you start with this. How, how do smarter buildings kind of move the ball forward uh, in terms of climate? Yeah, well, I, th I think, you know, most obviously, smarter buildings can be more efficient, right, can, can be better managed to drive waste out. That's the first step. But I think Tanya alluded to this earlier, that, you know, this kind of net zero goal that we've been shooting towards, which is over, you know, measured over the course of a year, um, you know, we're quickly, the, the market is quickly going to change to thinking about more real time carbon intensity of the grid and therefore the way a building uses energy may be more important than how much energy it uses. Um, and that balance is quickly becoming part of standards and certifications. And I think in the coming years for building owners and, and corporate entities that are trying to hit carbon goals, they'll have to think about and grapple with some of those, you know, new ways of thinking about the way a, a building's use contributes to overall carbon. The, the current metric of, you know, take the carbon mix on the grid that you're connected to, you know, multiply it by kilowatt hours used over the course of the year and call it good, that, that won't be good enough, you know, in five years. So we'll have to get smarter and, and more intelligent about it. So uh, either Brendan or, or Tanya, it seems to me that um, both 
um, getting fossil fuel use out of our buildings and getting fossil fuel use out of our cars uh, are part of that sort of carbon equation. So how does this fit in? Tanya, you've, you've started a little bit with the conversation about building electrification uh, and um, we sort of corporate sustainability goals aside, we're seeing more and more regulatory frameworks beginning to change uh, in relationship to permitting fossil fuel consumption in buildings. So um, how does all this relate? And then Brendan, I'll go to you on transportation. I'd love to share just a couple of little slides about that because I think this actually requires some education. And one major piece that we're seeing in user experience workshops is there's very little awareness. We need to make flexibility, regardless of the source of that flexibility, the new renewable energy, the new solar. We need to make flexibility like energy efficiency. It's gotta be huggable. And in order to understand that it's huggable, you really have to understand the time varying quality of energy, which most people don't understand. We need to be able to explain it simply, whether it's for decarbonization, or cost effectiveness. So here's a slide. Um, this is looking at renewable and how renewables interplay with our energy use. You know, this blue is uh, an energy, it's a load curve. And the icons that you see there are systems that drive energy use. So in this case, it's uh, electric vehicle, water heating and space heating. Later on, you see lighting and space heating again, and then other loads. And so those are electrical loads throughout the course of the day, you know, at their peak extended over time. And this is when you know solar is peaking. So anything, any energy use under that curve, obviously can be met by solar, anything outside of uh, met by fossil fuels on the grid, more or less. Now that goes for time of use pricing. So now we start adding time of use pricing and the same dynamic is at play. Anything underneath this red block will be very expensive. Anything underneath this red block is less expensive. And you know, we can keep going for demand charges. Anything over this line is like getting a speeding ticket and for the next month, you're gonna be hurting for certain. So I think really the key component for us as an industry is to be able to have interfaces, products and educational materials that help build this very intuitive sense of the time varying nature of energy resources, whether those are things that are using energy or things that are producing energy and how those two functions need to match up. And so um, I know that wasn't a very direct answer to your question, Stan, but I think it could be a lens. The flexibility lens is what we use to talk about any loads, any technology. And we really bring that because that essentially is what's needed to decarbonize. Um, yeah. No, I, I, uh, I like it. I think it does relate. Uh, obviously the notion of, um, of cleaning the grid is intimately related to this notion of how we're using our buildings. And uh, I love the diagrammatic uh, explanation there. Your icons are great. Brendan, um, re reflections from your perspective on the transportation side. No, not much to add. I got a pretty simple me mental model. I mean, squeeze all the juice out of buildings and put it into the cars and smart building systems help you do that. It's just, <laughs> you don't want to install extra infrastructure. You want to make best use of assets on site and um, you can use it for other end uses via the, the, you know, well, in this case, transportation, which is a very direct decarbonization technology. So yeah, squeeze the juice, put it in cars. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, fill her up, get to the buildings and fill her up. Yeah. Um, so let's move to another, uh, uh, layer in our cake here in relationship to asset management. That term gets thrown around uh, quite a bit, but I, I've always thought that it's a really, really difficult job to manage one building, uh, to, to, to make it work, uh, to make it profitable. Uh, and then I begin to think about um, large portfolios of buildings or campuses of buildings uh, where you've got multiple assets. So how do these technologies help those situations where people are managing beyond one building, uh, but a whole asset or portfolio of buildings or at a campus environment? And Hendrik, you want to take the first shot at that? Sure. Yeah, I think that um... But part of the challenge of managing a portfolio is just that you have different systems in every building, right? They were yeah. built at different times and rarely are those systems, you know, in any way kind of 
providing a, a common set of visibility or control. So layering over additional supervisory controls or interfaces to provide grid services is a way to get visibility into your existing assets um, and hopefully help you centralize some of your functions and management of those assets. So it feels like you know, at a portfolio scale, the more you can centralize and automate and have visibility from a common place means you can leverage your existing team across, you know, a bigger, um, instead of the building engineer in the basement of each building, you have a team of specialists that are able to kind of divide and conquer across the whole portfolio. I think the campus thing is really interesting because campuses, of course, have an interesting relationship to the grid and depending on how they're metered, their ability to actually flex their load and participate as an aggregated load um, is an interesting thing to, but, but I won't go down that that rabbit hole. But um, I do think just well, that. I think, no, I, I think yeah. I think go for it. geographic proximity yeah. uh, of this uh, is uh, is an important concept. Go for it. Yeah, I mean, both with shared systems, so where you have district systems or shared systems, of course, you have you're already part of the way towards having flexibility to move energy around and to capture waste energy from one building and move it to another building. But when you, even without shared energy systems, just if you have a portfolio of buildings that you can control together, you can increase the value of that control back to the grid. And of course, you know, the more we can kind of aggregate loads and participate in programs at scale, the easier it is for generation and transmission and distribution teams within utilities to actually put value to that and, and provide value back to the building owners. But I think the portfolio approach is really exciting as you try to unlock this market. Um, and of course, you know, most campuses also struggle with, you know, um, aging workforces and just challenge with managing all the different systems and disparate systems over decades of building out those campuses. So um, that presents probably the most compelling opportunity for grid interactive efficient buildings, in my opinion. Tanya, you were gonna, you were gonna jump in. I was just going to say, I was going to encourage you to talk about, you know, district energy, just, you know, given your experience with that. And, you know, I think you've said everything that I was hoping you would follow on with, which is that it presents a unique opportunity. I think some of the barriers to achieving, you know, what Henrik is talking about is, um, you know, you do see some campuses that are all or most of the load is behind one meter. And then some of your issue becomes that sub metering and just the amount of expense necessary to really understand. I saw Eric Van Orden is on this call from Copper Labs, and I know they're doing some cool stuff in residential, but it would be great for us to be able to have wider access, you know, but we're all bumping up against this, you know, freeing the data. Even if there is AMI, can we get access to it? Can we run algorithms that help us understand, you know, what submetered loads are creating those profiles for optimal management? So, you know, but these are technical details. And if we can get the right policies in place, I saw that Chad Blevins asked them, you know, a couple questions about how does participating in an electric utility program or not impact the requirements. And, you know, Henrik made a good answer, which is we need new rate structures and incentives. And in order to take advantage of those, you need the data and open access to be able to perform that control. I am really interested and I'll, um, Chad, now that I saw that, I'm going to post some um, resources in the chat for you. I'm very interested to see what Marianne Payette talked about the other day at the CEC, which is their load management rulemaking. Um, I'm happy to, uh, I'm going to post one of the uh, comments that we submitted to that proceeding in California, which is requiring utilities, investor-owned utilities in the state of California by 2024 to publish dynamic machine readable rates that include, for example, you know, we've paid for all this AMI architecture uh, infrastructure for utilities. And a lot of that AMI data is just moldering in an SAP or Oracle database somewhere. And they're averaging it monthly to do a bill. <laughs> so, you know, to Henrik's point, we really do need to translate that intelligence into utilities uh, like they're doing, I see in Southern California Edison's territory, looking at what capacity constraints they have at the local level, adding that as a component of their price, adding their fixed costs as a component of that price, adding carbon, wholesale, et cetera. And so their time varying price, you know, all we need to optimize then on the building side is one API feed from the CEC or whomever. That I think is the holy grail. In the meantime, it's a really good question about how do we take advantage cost effectively of that district scale stuff, I think for the time being, it's going to be integrators like um, Edo uh, for large customers who can afford it. And it's going to be inaccessible to smaller customers and more competitors who are not as well capitalized. 
because we've got to, you've got to go out there and have people who just focus on the bowl of spaghetti that is the sort of the data, the pricing, the API feeds, et cetera. So um, I just want to say that I think Henrik's right about that aggregated value. And I think we're moving toward it, but we should all be pushing for more of these rulemakings like they have in California to give us, you know, on the customer and the supplier side, a, a more even playing field and uh, more access for small to mid-sized organizations. Yeah. And, and utilities have a role to play, right? Utilities have a really important role to play in assure, ensuring affordability and equity, equity and access. And that applies to this, right? Utilities, um, you know, we see as a really key part of helping to drive programs that get to all of their customers in, in fair and equitable ways. So, it's, you know, it's exciting to think about the way utilities could really step up into that. Yeah, and in, in just a, a little bit, I want to um, have us sort of geek out a little bit on rates. So to Chad and others that are kind of waiting for that, uh, uh, hang on, we're, we're going to get to that. I want to get through the layers of my cake. Uh, I had one on cost savings, which was a little more focused directly on energy efficiency, and and uh, we can just yawn our way through that one, right? Because we're all we all got that one, right? If if we understand the value proposition, if the market appreciates any value proposition, the sort of lower bill portion of it is probably doesn't need a whole lot more explanation. So I'm willing to um, to to jump over um, the, that uh, piece of our cake and move to thinking about the value of the building as being a hub for vehicle charging. And Brendan and I was surprised yesterday when uh, uh, Ahmad in the, uh, in the earlier GEPS uh, discussion, uh, and I think I wrote this down and Ahmad, I apologize if I missed it, but he said, well, uh, I'm, the vehicle charging thing is a little difficult residentially because only 2% of the cars are actually at home. Uh, you know, during, um, uh, during the day. And so um, is that is ac accurate? And if they're not there at home during the day, where are they? Uh, and where are they getting charged? And is that now at work? And, and does this mean that for building owners, there's going to be a higher expectation that vehicle charging is part of the services that are being provided at the workplace? Yeah, I, I think the simple answer to that uh, is that for, it's gonna vary. You know, for many buildings, it is gonna be a very important place to charge and for others it won't, and that's okay. Uh, there's a, a stat that gets thrown around that is 80% um, of charging for customers happens at home, 20% happens at workplace or in the wild. And that stat is true if you are an early adopter of EVs who are more likely to live in single family homes, have driveways and have extra space on their panel. But the reality is if uh, the, the adopters of EVs over the next five years and all the commercial applications of EVs, fleets, you know, um, tenant services, you know, all the different ways that EVs are gonna be used, buildings, commercial buildings are gonna be a very viable and common place for them to charge. And so not every building, but many buildings will be expected either by code or by tenant or consumer demand to have 10, 30, 40 chargers on site. It's not just Amazon. And I think more than anything, uh, I hope to kind of beat that drum that it's not, it's, it's an amenity now, it's gonna be a required building service in the future for a variety of reasons. And it, you, you have to manage that charging. And it, it has to be uh, it has to be managed and controlled like the big end use it is from a cost from a building function perspective. So, um, to answer your question, yes, commercial buildings are a very important place to charge cars over the next five to ten years. Great, Hendrik or Tanya, anything you want to add to that? Well, let's move on to uh, the last layer of my cake, which is. Um, the speculation about um, post-COVID occupancy and the kind of future of the office and, and workplace, uh, there's a lot of speculation about what that's going to look like. Uh, but 
just about everyone seems to agree that the future is going to be something where there's greater flexibility because we're going to have variable occupancy, some of it being pretty unpredictable in relationship to occupancy patterns and buildings. So how can these technologies help building owners and managers um, deal with the future in which space use is way more flexible and variable than it has been in the past. And I'm going to have Tanya take the first shot at this. Oh, geez, of course. Um, by the way, I am going to, in the q and I'm putting some resources in there in between um, chats. Um, this is hard for someone like us. You know, we're really geeked out on AI. Um, we're really excited about its ability to automate a lot of the things that are very manual now. Like it's like you know, shooting fish in a barrel. It shouldn't be too hard to do better than you know things are getting more complex and having people do it. On the flip side, one thing AI is not great at is dealing with stuff that it's never seen before. It hasn't seen it in its training set. So, um, you know, I do think that in terms of research and development, you know, we're certainly working on this at, through our SBIR award that we won, um, research and development on how to speed up the training for AI around more variable things like occupancy. I mean, for us, we love a nice, we like stable occupancy because it's easier to predict the future when it looks a lot like the past. I think in addition to, you know, the occupancy problems, climate change creates some real problems for us. I mean, there's nowhere that our model is going to go like, oh, cool, 118 degrees in Portland. Yeah, that seems like something I could expect. So um, I think, you know, putting more development into faster training of AI, um, training with smaller data sets. Um, teaching AI to uh, respond better to novel phenomena and looking at ways to uh, structure any of these automated solutions to deal with that variability in post-COVID occupancy. I mean, now that's my bias because we're working in model predictive control, machine learning, AI, and controls, right? I would have, I'm sure that there are much more practical hands-on early uh, issues to consider. I know that we, you know, in terms of occupancy sensors and things like that, there are a lot of great examples of companies in Washington that are really building out their capabilities and making those sensors more robust and cheaper. So um, coming up with some really novel ways to predict occupancy um, so that that data is better and we don't have to rely so much on these baseline energy profiles from the building and then just sort of manual schedules. So I think that's one area that I'm really excited about and I will hand it off to someone who might have better things to say about it. No, that, that was great stuff. Uh, uh, Tanya uh, agreed that um, we, we can't rely on our previous Portland 118 degree weather in order to be predictive uh, for that. But Hendrik, I'm, uh, I'm yeah. let I me know what you think good. about, yeah, particularly the occupancy sensor side and what we know about who's in the building and where they are and whether that gives us some uh, flexibility in relationship to how the building's being operated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it's 99 out of 100 or 97 out of 100, but uh, the vast majority of buildings don't know where occupants are in the building, right? They have a schedule that's based on when they think people show up. And that is the first problem. And it's a simple optimization problem of just needing the data, needing to know how people are using a space so the space can be better conditioned. And we use a lot of proxies for that in buildings. You know, you use CO2 sensors, which are, which are pretty notorious for not being super robust long-term and you use ways to try to approximate how a building should respond to people, but you rarely actually know how people are using it. And so I think part of what, you know, that all this uncertainty around the way people may come back to work and how buildings may be used, um, we've got to start collecting the data and we've got to start putting sensors in so we have better understanding of just what that is. And, and that can be part of, you know, to Tanya's point, the long term of training AI. Um, but yeah, it, you know, you don't want to guess how people are going to come back to work or, or I want to guess <laughs> outside of uh, my abilities. But there's no doubt that the way we're going to use buildings is going to be different and we're going to have to reset some baselines and some expectations. And 
the traditional turn it on at seven because somebody might show up is going to change, right? We're going to have to be a little bit more nuanced in the way we think about occupancy. Um, and hopefully in doing so, we can start not just talking about well building certification and indoor air quality, but actually really being proactive about having systems that respond to humans and that produce really comfortable, productive spaces for humans, whether they're learning or working or healing. Um, you know, our, our buildings do a fine job of trying to maintain a level of comfort, but they're not super great at dealing with dynamics on the way buildings are being, or, you know, way people are using the spaces. So hopefully this ushers in, you know, a silver lining of all of this is that we, um, you know, invest in systems that we need already, that we need to make our spaces even better now. And that in doing so, we get the data and the visibility so we can design systems, whether they're AI or optimization models that just um, better manage building systems. Great. Um, well, this is, um, that gets me through my layer cake. Um, and I want to shift gears now. And Brendan, as uh, a former utility planner, I think I'm going to put you on point for this first discussion, because as promised, we're going to talk a little bit about rate structures here. Um, for most people and most of our lives, we have had the sort of luxury of a plain vanilla rate structure, uh, which has provided uh, quite a bit of, um, let's say, options and flexibility or uh, for uh, on the consumer side of things. But um, it's always been the reality that that energy costs are, uh, in fact, dynamic. And as we look at the process of migrating to more dynamic rate structures, uh, this is a a, a wholesale change for a lot of people in relationship to thinking about um, how they're using the commodity and when. So what role will utility rate reform play in all of this? And how do we construct the narrative for building owners that, um, that going along with the dynamic pricing structure uh, is uh, ultimately to their benefit? It's funny. In the Northwest, we have such an aversion to time of use rates, or it seems like a novel thing, maybe is the way I should put it. Um, but most of the country, it's just the way the grid operates and customers are, are used to it. And so I, I, I think I would answer your question is there's nothing to be scared of. And I don't think we need to convince a lot of building owners and operators that this is something that is a momental change. It's just a the utilities need to be very transparent about the structure of the rates and how that's going to change over time and provide that in a very open way to the systems that operate buildings and chargers and all the other end uses. And so I, yeah, I, I think I would hope that we don't have to convince anybody that this, that this is a, a good thing or the direction that, that things are going, just because if you look at the differential rates in Southern California, certain times of the day, it's, you know, building owners are working with it, charge management systems are using it to reduce cost. And so it's just, yeah, I, I think it's a couple things. One, don't be afraid. It's happening elsewhere. <laughs> and just push our utility partners to make it transparent and easy, um, uh, easy to use, easy to digest and have certainty about how it's going to change. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's a fire worth uh, um, getting too scared of. Okay, um, Anya, do you, uh, uh, do you buy, buy into that? Well, yes, I do. I mean, I, you're not, this is a, that's the Pacific Northwest for you. Mostly we all just agree, um, but we have different flavors of agreeing. So I will just uh, add on to what's already been said, which was- promo. I like that, yeah. <laughs> I think yesterday's Gab group really talked about the need for customer engagement here. Um, you know, having been briefly, uh, before I started Community Energy Labs, I was briefly at Portland General Electric, you know, in that customer programs. And they were looking at lots of different time of use especially when you're at the residential scale, but even some commercial, we have such low rates here and people have not really been exposed to those, what those rates mean. They don't really understand the concept either of the different components and charges on their bill. So it's, it's kind of weird to go straight to dynamic rates in behavioral based programs where people don't get what they're supposed to be doing. So I like the CEC's approach and I put a um, link to the rates program below 
where they really believe that the key to doing this is to explain the benefits of decarbonization, to focus first on the commercial sector. I think Washington is sort of trending in that direction to pilot some of these rates and to look for programmatic rollouts where they are coupled with uh, automation, you know, yeah. so that people aren't like, I mean, what we, what I saw at least, you know, as a passenger uh, on that journey was when you look at time of use pricing at like PGE, people are like, I, I, I'm sure it makes sense, but I don't understand why I did nothing and I got $8 today. And then I turned everything off the next day and got a dollar. Um, prior to being at PGE, we be, I'd been doing work with PCI. We had done a bunch of sort of customer discovery work with um, demand response programs, not just time of use, but demand response. And, you know, I remember one mom in particular, and we were like, do you participate in your utilities demand response for a program? And she's like, wait, is that that thing where they want me to like turn off my air conditioning on the hottest day in summer for $5 a month? And I'm like, yeah, that's it. And she's like, yeah, no, I never do that. That's <laughs> so um, I just, I think that the one little piece of color that I would add to that is that maybe starting with residential isn't the best place. Um, and really we should be thinking about dynamic rates are not something, I mean, I have a microgrid in my home. I am the nerdiest nerd of the nerds. I don't have any dynamic pricing, but I'm always trying to sop up all my solar energy. I've got battery, I've got my sub meter and I'm trying to make everything look perfect. Even I am too lazy for that little bit of carbon savings to turn my dishwasher on at noon, to run out and plug my EV in because I don't have a fancy app that'll do that for me to turn things on and off at the right time. So I really want to say that I think we should be pushing for these dynamic rates. It's not going to hurt. The rate study um, below showed that you can make these dynamic rates look to a regular residential customer like what they're used to, these sort of boxy time of use windows. Um, even with a dynamic price, as long as you have automation. So I think coupling these programs with automation is key. And there are some enabling pieces that we need to work on in the automation space in terms of freeing data and access and reducing the amount of hassle and increasing the amount of interoperability on that automation side. But that's my soapbox. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I agree with you. I, I really do. I, mean, I think your friend's understanding about time of use rates work like, oh, yeah, it's the time that's more expensive or, you know, uh, that's kind of all the customers really need to understand. It's just the automation piece that actually monetizes, makes the system run well, provides the value. Um, so but I, I agree with you. It's, it's uh, you know, consumer um, understanding is important to a point. Automation is the thing that makes it work. I just want to say that uh, neither Brendan or Hendrik or I are judging you at all uh, for not wanting to run out to the garage uh, at noon to, to plug in your car. So uh, I did want it's okay. to. When I first started, I was so good. Okay. I was so good. I only ran the I still only run the dryer at noon when it's sunny. But <laughs> I'm just like everything, else, I'm just like oh. Um, but I, you know, just to follow on with that, I mean, automation is all that matters. But here's here's the thing: when you start bringing in HVAC and stuff like that, if you've got a multifamily apartment building with 50 units. Let's take the you know 20 that all are getting the same solar insulation. They all have the exact same underlying systems. So these are identical. The way utilities look at them is they should all respond identically, but we know for a fact mm -hmm. over multiple end use studies, that is never what happens. So automation can't solve everything. You do need to understand why people do the things that they do. And so that's what I was saying about some of the R&D that we're doing right now between the interactions between customer preferences and behavior and automation. So if somebody who considers themselves a deep green environmentalist also has a electric dryer, is that a different level of flexibility than somebody who just wants to save costs? So I do think understanding customers to a deeper level, it's more than just giving them dynamic rates and giving them automation in order to get them to adopt automation, um, in order for that automation, to, for them to not override that automation. We can't just think that they're all a bunch of super logical automatons and they would just do this if they had the information. That is absolutely not true. You know, they are valuing something. My friend, that, you know, the woman that I asked about the demand response, she was val valuing her own comfort and convenience. And that was at time and energy that she could be spending on something else like prepping her, packing lunches for her kids' school. So um, we just can't just think of value in terms of money. It's also time and comfort and convenience. And that is very personal. And I'm not saying it's a impossible level of personalization 
but I don't think that automation is going to like solve the time of use problem unless that automation itself has a good understanding of customer behavior and preferences. Yeah, well said. Well, let's spin out of the rate discussion, Hendrick, and um, look at, and I think Tanya opened the door to this, just talking a little bit about what sort of um, financial incentive structures beyond just rates, whether we're talking about um, kind of utility uh, programmatic uh, approaches here uh, in order to kind of woo customers uh, in this direction. Um, if you wanted to describe uh, a little bit about what you think those ideal program structures would look like uh, to be most persuasive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it builds off the rate conversation because, you know, on, on one end, we're saying we shouldn't have utilities just upsize all the infrastructure, right, at a, at a centralized scale. And on the other side, I don't think we should just expose all the real-time costs for every single user and just hope that the whole thing balances out, right? There's a whole lot in between, and that's where utilities have a role to play in programs, both in incentives, but also, you know, I think Deborah Smith talked about owning school buses, Mary Kip and, and in the opening session also talked about utility ownership of resources. And I think there are ways that utilities could be, could leverage the things they do well, which is equity and scale um, and driving some of these programs into buildings so that they can take some of that first cost uncertainty away from from building owners, right? We're talking about investments in systems that make their building more flexible. And then we talk about super dynamic rate structures. And I guarantee that those building owners don't have 10 year models of how their rates may change and how grid services may be valued and therefore whether they should put a battery in or thermal storage, <laughs> advanced controls, right? So we don't have that. So we've got a chicken and egg problem. Utilities can fill that role by rolling out programs that allow them to first get better visibility. And then with that visibility, start to make um, create programs that anybody can participate in so they're equitable, but that actually start embedding systems and equipment in buildings that could be owned by the building owner. It could be jointly owned and controlled by the utility. There's different forms of ownership that in control that could take place based on the asset. But it feels like if we want to transform our energy system in the near term and decarbonize, utilities have a big role to play in deploying capital into buildings past the meter to start getting visibility, creating that pathway for building owners to transition their equipment and helping with this automation gap, right? Um, I think that there's a, and it's exciting to think about how utilities could do that at scale and, and drive value that um, I think we might've lost when we did, you know, with the rooftop solar, you know, feed-in tariff kind of model of that. You don't necessarily drive the total system value when you just say, okay, we'll, we'll let you feed in at, you know, at retail rates. So just, just a perspective there. Um, yeah, Brendan. Yeah, one more thing. Please. Yeah, yeah. It, just in terms of what can utilities do, um, I think there's also some pretty simple things uh, that utilities as product operator uh, or paying incentives that can be arbitrators of what makes a good and connected product. And so, you know, the utilities maintain qualified products lists for lighting and other appliances, and you know, uh, at least for charging systems, there's a tremendous analogy to systems that are very usable, they're highly connected, they're scalable, and consumers only get an incentive if they use those systems. And so utilities in California are really out in front on this. Not every utility has to have their own qualified product list, um, but just utilities broadly deciding what a good product is that customers will use and will benefit them for charging systems is really, really valuable. And so things like the Design Light Consortium qualified products list for lighting, there's a great analogy for charging systems that utilities can do. So another fairly simple thing uh, that utilities are well positioned for. Great. Well, um, we have about seven or eight minutes left in our session, and this could go on for a really long time. You guys have been very engaging and informative. So I wanna have each of you take a couple of minutes and just tell us a little bit about what you think or a couple of things that building owners ought to do right now, and then future cast a bit, say in five years, what's the picture going to look like? You know, what are building owners going to be investing in? What are building facility operators going to be doing differently? And how are utilities going to be interacting differently with their customers? So it's a little bit of the here and now, and then where are we going? 
uh, and take a couple of minutes each. Tanya, I'll let you go first. Uh, right I, I should have said that right head. up at the start. Yeah, uh, lucky, Tanya, lucky yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the guys are just like, yeah, Tanya, yeah, you go first. Cool. You go first. Um, I'm still like thinking about what Brendan was saying earlier, and I just want to say before we move on to this that I super agree. I think there's going to be a partnership. You know, I think back to um, Pearl Street in New York. I think of uh, the first microgrid in Appleton, Wisconsin, which was a huge disaster because it was trying to use this little micro hydro. And it's like, hey, sometimes the lights are on, guys. <laughs> um, and having been at a utility and you know, seeing the way that we manage, in particular, investor owned utilities and really large utilities, um, trying to sort of get at this problem, it's really difficult because the smart way to manage this as our grid has expanded is to have very siloed, very specialized groups. Um, but that is not how we need to solve these problems. We need to go back to the future. Like really we've got to solve it at the small sort of microgrid level in a way. It's gonna be one Pearl Street station leads to an Appleton microgrid leads to the next. And we start improving our best practices and building upon those. So I was very excited to see the DOE's Connected Communities FOA, which really attempts to try to show how this could work and okay, maybe it'll be, I don't know, 12 projects, who knows how many, um, but those projects should then, you know, be used to sort of advance what is essentially a new paradigm shift. You know, I know that a lot of sort of utility facing programs around energy and even buildings, for example, get kind of ragged on for being really old school um, and really analog but they, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They've been working as designed for a long time. However, in the early days of the utility industry, I mean, talk about geeking out. I read books like Edison and the Electric Chair and I'm really into like the history <laughs> of the grid and that book, The Grid, which was great. Yeah. Our, we were like young tech in the 1800s, man. There were like power lines everywhere and everybody had a different microgrid and it was AC versus DC. And it was like a very innovative. So how are we gonna do this? I think what we need to do is go back to the future and we need to be looking at um, projects that are co-created. It's not like, hey, I'm a utility distribution engineer and I think you need this or I wanna do this or this is my pet project and now I'm gonna go out and recruit a couple nonprofits who put their stamp on it and they're like, yeah, that's cool. You know, that you're going into the community and you're really going like, hey, we've got this problem and it's very open. You don't have the answer. Something like distribution system planning, but that engages communities to sort of lead the pack and say, well, we have some tools that you might be able to use to solve this. And so I see a lot of this happening in with distribution system planning proceedings, for example, with PGE in um, California. And I think the future really looks like that. It looks like an innovative future where we're trying to solve some of these problems with GEBS, the grid, decarbonization, which is really a systemic problem. And we're trying to answer those questions about interoperability, data, security, reliability, carbon. It's very difficult to answer those for an entire state because it's so heterogeneous. But the more we can start solving it sort of bird by bird and coordinating with each other in fora like this, the more I hold out hope that we're going to start iterating toward a solution that matures, but it's going to be a little rough, I think, over the next couple, mm -hmm. 10 years on that front. Yeah, well, they'll be writing books about you all. Um, Brendan, your turn. All right, uh, Stan, sorry, I'm going to kind of do the politician thing and answer maybe not the question that you asked, but the question that <laughs> I talked that about. I should have asked. No, no, but it's more just in the future. Um, I want building owners and managers to be an educated consumer as it pertains to buying smart charging systems. And so I want to leave people with um, a simple rubric. If you're in the market for smart chargers, think of these three things. And so uh, usable, scalable, and integrated is what you should be looking for. Um, what I mean by usable is a charging system's only as good as your ability to understand what the heck's going on and at a base level, charge your cars and a higher level, reduce costs and increase function in your business. And if you can't use the system, it's junk. So make sure it's usable, make sure it's scalable. So it uh, works with all your existing and future assets. Um, I've seen many examples of a company investing in three or four smart charging systems and they don't talk to each other. 
not scalable. So really think critically about that. And then the third thing is integration. You know, the dream is a single screen where you see the building and the solar system and the charging system all functioning together and really push a charging provider to tell you how they're, how they're gonna get you there. Saying a, you know, an open ADR API exists is not a good answer. You know, sh you should ask and <laughs> make those charging system providers show you how, how they're gonna support your integrated system. So uh, that's the vision of the future, be an educated consumer when you're uh, thinking about charging. Perfect. Hendrik, last word. Well, I'll go fast. I think to, to get through this challenge in front of us and tremendous opportunity, we've, we've got to start forging new relationships. So building on what Tanya said, we have tremendous opportunity to get different people together in the same room trying to solve these broader problems. And it's not just the perspective of a building operator, it's the building um, staff, it's the occupants of the building, it's the utilities providing them service, it's the generators that are, you know, the, the not just utility as a monolith, but all the players within a utility. And the more we can facilitate new relationships, I think we'll start driving new programs. And those programs won't be one size fits all. We'll have to adjust to, <laughs> time is going to be hard. Um, we'll have to adjust to the way that building owners and operators want to participate. Some might want somebody else to deal with the complexity. Others might love the complexity and want to optimize their own facilities, but we've got to find ways to sort of start the conversation, educate owners and operators and utilities together and learn together from one another and create some new programs. And not all of them will work, but um, we've got to just keep experimenting and learning. Fantastic. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you all uh, for your contributions. Uh, I learned a lot throughout. And to our attendees, thank you so much for uh, attending the Smart Buildings Exchange. Uh, I hope you found it uh, really valuable and we hope to see you next year in person. Thanks so much. Have a good day. See everybody, thank you.